In the 21st century, we all march to a digital beat. Electronic devices shape how we work, talk, travel, and play. And at the very heart of today's technology lies a tiny but extraordinary invention. It did for the electronic world what uh, the printing press did for publishing. In my lifetime, I don't know of anything that's had that much importance. You look around, every it's every place. We couldn't be having this conversation without it. Its inventor is not a household name, but to those who knew him, Robert Noyce is one of the key figures of the modern age. Imagine a person who combines Thomas Edison with Henry Ford, a man who invents the seminal product of our time and also builds around it the most important company in the world. That's Bob Noyce. Noyce laid the foundations of America's most innovative industry. Silicon Valley is built on the technological contributions that Bob either did or inspired in others. But Noyce also fostered a new kind of business culture. He rejected corporate hierarchy and empowered his employees, inspired by the can-do spirit of the American heartland. And Noyce combined his values and scientific intellect with the most charismatic personality in Silicon Valley. He had this way of looking at you extraordinarily intently, like there's nothing else on his mind. Robert Noyce may be the most important person most people have never heard of. Two thousand and nine is the fiftieth anniversary of the discovery that transformed our world. At a lab in California, Robert Noyce, a young physicist, found a way to shrink the size and cost of electronic circuits. His invention became known as the integrated circuit. We're so accustomed to it now. It's so completely changed our reality that we don't appreciate what an enormous leap in thinking the integrated circuit was. But even its name gives you a hint of what changed. Until then, electronics was a discrete process. You built discrete devices. They were capacitors or resistors. They did one thing. This is one of the uh, circuit boards that were used in a DAC computer in the early 60s. You have discrete components, resistors, capacitors, and computers were built with literally hundreds of these circuit boards. The integrated circuit was able to replace in a single chip the entire electronics that was contained in this board. Noyce's breakthrough enabled the components of an entire electronic circuit to be printed on a tiny silicon chip. The jump from the transistor, this solid state cylinder that does one thing, and to turn it into a process that goes from essentially physics to printing, to take a three-dimensional object and make it into a two-dimensional object that can be almost infinitely reproduced and reduced in size and, and given ever greater complexity, that's an enormous intellectual leap. An entire printer circuit board can be replaced by a chip roughly every five to ten years. And uh, that's how the progress of technology has occurred. That's why today we can have in a desk a computer that would, would, uh, would be the size of a football field in 1960. Silicon Valley, the home of America's microelectronics industry, was built on the success of the integrated circuit. But it was also shaped by Noyce's second great legacy. He believed that companies should be open and egalitarian. Rebelling against the top-down East Coast business model, he inspired a West Coast workplace where innovation came before convention. Noyce wanted open communications. He wanted a cafeteria where everybody ate together, no sort of executive dining rooms. He wanted a parking lot where there were no assigned parking spaces. He wanted a culture that was defined not by hierarchy, 
not by your position within the company, but instead by your knowledge. You could sit in a meeting with Bob Noyce and uh, no one felt as though you were to be preempted by someone senior or someone junior. You could argue with people, you could challenge people, you could ask questions. You just had to know what you were talking about. Bob's management style became a paradigm for enlightened management. The person who learned that better than anybody, interestingly, is a generation ahead, which is Steve Jobs. I think Steve Jobs' belief in always being a maverick, always being on the cutting edge, taking risk, and empowering your people to do stuff, that he got that from noise. Steve Jobs of Apple and Bill Gates of Microsoft, who both grew up in the 1960s, were among the first globally known figures of the digital age. But Noyce and his colleagues, who ushered in that age, belong to an earlier generation, one with its roots in the 19th century. Noyce was born in the Midwestern state of Iowa in 1927. He was the son of a Congregationalist preacher, and when he was 12, the family settled in the small farming town of Grinnell, founded a century earlier by members of the church. To understand Bob Noyce and all the success he had as an adult, you have to understand what it was like to grow up in Grinnell, Iowa, where community really mattered. And Noyce came back to this again and again throughout his life. We weren't dependent upon outside resources in small town Iowa. If something broke, you fixed it. The small, self-sufficient community, which builds confidence in the participants in that community to, to do whatever they need to do. My father liked building things. He grew up during the Depression, and so a lot of things that uh, he wanted to have, he would have to make by himself. His mother would often rely on him to fix things for her, and uh, then when something finally did get thrown away, he would use it for something else. Young Bobby's most ambitious project was to build a working glider. He enlisted his brother Gaylord and their friends to help. All of a sudden, one summer, why, uh, the word got around that uh, uh, Bobby's going to build a glider with Gaylord, and it was a kind of a neighborhood project. Uh, but it mostly it was their project. Now the glider wasn't too big. It was probably about eight or ten feet long. They'd climb into the thing and carry it along and then be able to jump and leap. And on the appointed day, Noyce scrambled to the roof of a barn behind their house. He had his brother hand him the glider and he started running. And when he got to the end of that barn roof, he didn't stop. He just kept going. And when he landed, he was just ecstatic. He was the sort of person who got to the end of a roof and kept going. That sense that with the right team behind him, he could do anything served him well for the rest of his life. Inside these walls Freedom come, freedom come Noyce didn't remain a believer, but he always held on to the values of his Congregationalist upbringing. Grinnell's 19th century pioneers had left the conservative East Coast for the American frontier to set up a free-thinking, non-conformist community. Our congregations are independent. That is to say, the we are part of a denominational structure, but the denomination or the national church has no authority whatsoever over the individual congregations. So this sense of individualism, responsibility for your own uh, decisions and your own future uh, is very much part of the tradition, and I think that was part of Bob's upbringing and ex exceedingly influential with him. Grinnell was exceptional for a small town in having a highly respected college, a legacy of its founding fathers. 
After graduating top of his year in high school, Noyce enrolled at Grinnell College and embraced campus life to the full. The interesting thing about Noyce is he doesn't fit the stereotype of your classic high-tech nerd. He was uh, very into swimming. He swam his entire life, so he was always in great shape. He didn't look like a nerd. He looked like a jock. Uh, and with that deep voice of his and his outgoing manner and his natural leadership, I suspect he ruled that campus. But for all his other activities, Noyce never lost his academic focus. He found a kindred spirit in the college's physics professor, Grant Gale. Well, my sense is they were two of a kind. Bob Noyce was a tinkerer, Grant Gale was a tinkerer. They both liked to figure out how things worked. Um, they didn't necessarily like to just read about it. Under Gale's tuition, Noyce explored the principles behind the technology of the day. Particularly, how the flow of electricity could be amplified to power and control radio or telephone devices. The idea is to produce a valve. Something like this. What's a valve? Well, what a valve does is controls the flow of water. If I were able to figure out a way of controlling this valve by a very weak flow of water, I could then go ahead and get a larger response in the amount of water flowing out here. That would be an amplifier. That's what I want to build, except I want to build it for electricity. Now, a way was developed for doing this early in the 20th century. That's basically the electron vacuum tube. The disadvantages are, well, they use a fair amount of power because of the heater. They're a little bit big for a lot of applications that one might have in mind. And the other is that there's simply the cost of, of, of construction of this thing. But Noyce was about to get an early look at a brand new invention that would render the electron tube extinct. It was called the transistor. Here at last was a device so tiny that several would fit inside a thimble. They can do the same job as electron tubes and require only a fraction of the power tubes used to operate. Invented in 1947 by John Bardeen, Walter Brattain, and William Shockley, the transistor used a solid material called a semiconductor to act as an amplifier, or switch. Through personal connections, Grant Gale got hold of technical reports about the device at an early stage and shared them with Noyce. This enlarged diagram shows that a transistor is a sandwich made of three layers of a semiconducting metal. The first layer is the emitter, the middle layer is the base, and the third layer is the collector. The emitter is a reservoir of electrons. There is a barrier, like a dam, in the base. The height of this dam may be raised and lowered by a very small amount of electric current, thus regulating the flow of electrons from the emitter to the collector. The final transistors look like this. The advantages are, well, they don't take an awful lot of power. The size is nice. Smaller, a lot smaller than the electron tube. And these are a lot cheaper to make than to make something like this. Well, the story of noise is like the story of Silicon Valley, in the sense that luck has an enormous part to play in all of this being in the right place at the right time. This amazing coincidence that you have this guy with a natural aptitude for it, taking a class from one of the few professors in the country, especially in the heartland, who's interested in transistors. Million to one shot. And that's how we get Bob Noyce. Seven years after he graduated from Grinnell College, Noyce, like his congregationalist forebears, headed west to the new frontier. In February 1956, he flew to California for the most important job interview of his life. Now 28, Noyce was accompanied by his wife, Betty, whom he'd met while studying for his PhD. 
what drew them to each other? I, I, you know, these things are always a big mystery. M my mother was a very witty, clever person. I think my father appreciated that. Uh, and he always had this charismatic quality that I never, he never had any trouble finding girlfriends. The Noises had been living in Philadelphia, where Bob worked in the transistor department of the electronics company, Philco. But he'd now been invited to apply for a job with William Shockley, the co-inventor of the transistor, who was recruiting the brightest young talents in the industry. Never lacking in confidence, Noyce found a new house before he did the interview. Well, my wife was not going to move to the West Coast unless she was living in a house instead of an apartment. I wanted very much to go to work for Bill Shockley. So, so you did and it. I was pretty confident I'd get a job <laughs> offered. Noyce got the job, but his wife's demand for a housing upgrade was understandable. Shockley had chosen to locate his new company in the mainly farming area south of San Francisco. This was in order to be near Stanford University and his elderly mother. Otherwise, the future Silicon Valley seemed like the back of beyond. I came from a very large company back east, and uh, so that was a big leap of faith to begin with. And then when I got out here and I saw the uh, so rather primitive nature of things, it was a bit of a shock, but a challenge at the same time. Shockley planned to build a silicon transistor, which would be cheaper and more reliable than the industry standard germanium. His previous experience made Noyce a key figure in the development effort. He started out uh, six or seven jumps ahead of everybody else, and everybody grew, but he was always, he always had more of a background. And he was a very bright guy, and uh, we all looked up to him, uh, you know, for technical advice. Bob had a way of looking at problems that came up with unique proposals or solutions. He was an idea factory, uh, and he casually threw out these ideas and people either pick them up or not, and he very seldom followed up on any of the suggestions. But they were all so good that you couldn't just dismiss them out of hand. A few months after Noyce joined, Shockley won a Nobel Prize for co-inventing the transistor and took the team out to celebrate. But the smiles on Noyce and his colleagues' faces masked a growing anxiety about Shockley's leadership. Bill Shockley was a very volatile person. His personality on a daily basis changed markedly. He could be as charm he could charm you so that he charm you out of your shoes, so as to speak. And other times he would be very, very tough, very uh, insensitive, and would ask could ask you and did me uh, such questions as, "Did you really earn your PhD?" William Shockley ran his lab for, in some sense, his own ego. Ideas that came from William Shockley were pursued. Ideas that came from anyone else were not. Shockley lost interest in building a silicon transistor and told the team to pursue a new project, which they considered commercially unviable. Finally, seven of Noyce's colleagues complained to the man funding Shockley, Arnold Beckman. Unfortunately, we discovered that a, a bunch of young kids had a difficult time shoving aside a recent Nobel laureate, and Dr. Beckman decided to stay with Shockley rather than to uh, you know, do the kind of things we were after. And at that stage, we just felt we had burnt our bridges so badly that there was no way we could repair things at Shockley, and we'd all have to go out and look for other jobs. Starting our own company was not something that was done in those days. There was no venture capital as we know it today, and no history of that. And so that was sort of not number one on the list. And we uh, began to explore this. We decided we really wanted to stay together, and someone came up with the idea, well, why don't we get somebody in New York, see if they can raise money for us. And that's how we contacted Hayden and Stone. I came out to San Francisco with one of the partners of Hayden Stone, and uh, we were very impressed with the seven of them. The seven included Julius Blank and Gordon Moore, but not Noyce. Bob was an extremely loyal person, but uh, in the ensuing weeks, uh, 
it became apparent that uh, he could no longer get along with Shockley any more than the other seven. With Noyce on board, the group headed to a San Francisco hotel to meet Arthur Rock and his colleague Bud Coyle. They agreed to form a company with the two investment bankers. Bud Coyle whipped out a bunch of uh, dollar bills in which he, he asked each one of us to sign our name to it uh, to cement the agreement and uh, it has ten signatures on it, the eight of us, uh, Art Rock and Bud Coyle. The group was later mythologized in the industry as the Traitorous Eight. But by spinning off from an established semiconductor company to form their own, Noyce and his colleagues set a precedent for the startups that would drive the growth of Silicon Valley. What these men were doing was a revolutionary, a radical act. To leave a company, to start another one, this was not done in 1957. Looking at it with hindsight, it's easy to tell that if this was a revolution, what was happening at the Clift Hotel was the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The Shockley defectors had an ambitious proposal. They wanted to find a corporation which would fund them to set up their own semiconductor division. Effectively, a company within a company, and then share the profits. So we made up a list of uh, about 35 companies and uh, it appeared that they were all interested, but none of them could see how this would fit in with their corporate culture. So they all passed on it until uh, somebody told me to go see Sherman Fairchild. Sherman Fairchild owned a New York-based technology company. He loaned Noyce and his colleagues more than a million dollars to establish their own firm on the West Coast, with the option to buy them out, if it was a success. The group had chosen the perfect moment to create their own company. Within weeks, the launch of Sputnik triggered the space race. The Cold War had become a battle of technology. saw an enormous increase, really just a dramatic spike in American spending on not just electronics, but anything that today might be called high tech. And this small group of eight guys was in the vanguard. In November 1957, Noyce and the team moved into an empty facility just down the road from Shockley Labs and began building their company, Fairchild Semiconductor, from scratch. You start out with just eight pairs of hands and feet and, uh, and brains and you had to build everything up from there. We had a fairly simple goal. We were going to make the silicon transistor and get it on the market. There's an excitement in the air. You don't know what it is, but it's there. And you see people working and getting things done and not fighting about it, but just doing it. As director of research and development, Noyce was the most senior of the eight. But he set about forging a collaborative culture that was ahead of its time. It was crucial to Bob, I think, not to be Bill Shockley. He was not going to be paranoid. So it was a very casual, collegial atmosphere. Uh, anybody could go talk to Bob. He essentially let his people run loose, entrusted them with the company, and they came through. He was the essence of what I would consider a good leader. He could come to you and talk with you and see how he could help you. This is the something that Shockley never did. Another source of this type of thinking undoubtedly, was again, Grinnell. He was thinking back to the small town where he grew up, a place where whether you were the preacher's child or a farmer's kid, it didn't matter. You all were in the same classroom together. You played on the same sports teams. You were all together. And that, he thought, created a vibrant society.
Fairchild's early years were remarkably productive. Not only did the team build a commercial silicon transistor, they also devised a way of mass producing the devices. A pattern of the transistor structure would be projected onto a wafer of silicon, using special lenses to shrink the size of the image. The projected pattern reacted with light-sensitive chemicals, printing the structure on the surface. This technique enabled entire sheets of transistors to be produced at the same time, and then cut up into individual chips and packaged. But actually joining different transistors into a circuit was intricate and painstaking. Transistors were made in large sheets, and you made many of them at a time. When you made them into a circuit, you would take one of these, and then from some other source, you would take another one, and so forth, and this is the way you would build your circuit. Now, if you look at that, you think there must be a better way. After all, I'm taking these elements, I'm cutting them apart, putting them together so that somebody else can wire the things together. There should be some way of actually building the entire circuit on a single piece of silicon. Noyce's colleague, Jean Ernie, had suggested that a layer of silicon dioxide could act as a protective coating for an entire wafer of transistors. In January 1959, in what would be his key scientific insight, Noyce realized that Ernie's process could enable all the components of a circuit to be printed and connected to each other on a single silicon chip. This meant entire circuits could be mass-produced. Noyce had found a way to manufacture ready-made, integrated circuits. This, as we know now, was a fundamental insight. Really, in some sense, a world-changing insight. And yet, Noyce jots down his notes and does nothing. Every bit of energy at that company was focused on products that they knew would make them money. The integrated circuit seemed like a nice idea. Someday, maybe someplace, they would be able to do something with this, but not right now. But two months after Noyce had noted his ideas, Jack Kilby, a researcher for Fairchild's rival Texas Instruments, announced his own integrated circuit. It was coincidence but Kilby's notes for his invention predated Noyce's. Kilby's circuit, however, was made of germanium, now seen as an outdated material, and could never be commercially viable. Noyce's silicon chip could be. The two are now credited as the co-inventors of the integrated circuit. Jack Kilby is the first person to come up with the idea of an integrated circuit, or at least the first one to write it down. Bob Noyce was the first one to come up with one that could be built in mass quantities. The first person to develop an integrated circuit that would then lead to pretty much any item you use today that has an on-off switch. Fairchild now had a cutting-edge product on their hands. The problem was, it was so cutting-edge, there was no real market for it as yet. Noyce, who had been promoted to general manager, had to find ways to publicize the device and convince customers to design uses for it. This is a report on integrated circuits with Dr. Harry Sello. Hello. We're here to tell you about a recent revolution in electronics. The marketing guys said, let's do a talk and an explanation and take it right out to the purchasers and the buyers. All of them we can round up by way of a film and give it to as many at one time as we can. You know, it's exciting to think that all of these functions are here today. They can be used, they're available. And it's even more exciting when you consider the number of applications that these can be put to. Actually, the uses of integrated circuits are limited only by those who are designing these uses. Integrated circuit chips could be used in everything from radios to missile guidance systems to computers but it was still cheaper for customers to hand-assemble their own circuits. Noyce urgently needed to get his manufacturing costs down. To do this, he slashed the price of the chips to less than it cost Fairchild to make them, a move that baffled his staff. 
I was chatting with the manufacturing manager as the news broke that Bob was at an industry conference and announced that all integrated circuits, these were the pro most complex products, lots of transistors in, in one chip, will sell for no more than a dollar. And this manufacturing guy was sitting in my office, really annoyed. Where does he get off announcing one dollar prices? I can't even make it for five. But Noyce realized that the greater demand created by a lower price would drive down manufacturing costs, and a cheaper price would convince customers that integrated circuits were a mainstream product. This is an example of Bob's out-of-the-box thinking, if you wish. A good idea for an area in which he wasn't necessarily an expert by his training. But uh, this was typical Bob Noyce to come up with the unusual solution. Noyce's gamble worked. Demand for the integrated circuit took off. Under his watch, Fairchild became wildly successful. For, it, it was the Google of its day. This was a company that was growing faster than any other company on Wall Street for a while. Processes, product, packages, price. Invented here. The sophistication of integrated circuits was also increasing at a rapid rate, while the cost of manufacture continued to fall. Gordon Moore noted that steadily improving production techniques meant the number of transistors on a chip was doubling every year. He predicted that this would continue for at least the next decade. One of my colleagues dubbed this Moore's Law. And uh, since then, Moore's Law has been applied to about anything that changes exponentially with time, and I'm happy to take credit for all of it. Sing we and chant it for the crowned. As at college, Noyce still found time to enjoy a bewildering array of leisure activities. He directed a chorus of madrigal singers, nicknamed Noyce's Voices. He remained a keen swimmer and indulged his boyhood passion for flight, qualifying as a pilot and buying his first plane. These pursuits offered an escape from aspects of his job that he didn't enjoy. The problem at Fairchild was that it was located on the West Coast as a subsidiary of an East Coast company. And the East Coast companies had uh, operated in a way differently than the new West Coast companies did. Noyce had been answering to Fairchild's New York-based parent company ever since Sherman Fairchild had exercised his option to buy out the eight founders. This had made Noyce and his colleagues wealthy men. But they'd lost their independence and essentially become employees of an old-school East Coast corporation which Noyce felt showed little respect for its most successful division. My father would travel to New York for corporate headquarters meetings and one time, it was winter, his plane arrived late, it was very stormy. The cab couldn't take him all the way, but he got out and he walked the rest of the way and made it to the meeting, and nobody else showed up. The people who lived right next door didn't show up, and he was very disillusioned by that. There was this hierarchical attitude in business. It was, uh, as one person described it, it's, you know, on the East Coast you build things that are monolithic, big, large, solid, and secure. And out here in the valley, you have to create your own rules. And there's a lot of people like you out here that are bright who also want to create their own rules. Just as its founders had broken away from Shockley, Fairchild had steadily been losing senior staff to new startups, which offered greater autonomy and a larger slice of the profits. These so-called Fairchildren were driving the growth of Silicon Valley. You can make a very good case that Fairchild was the most amazing gathering of entrepreneurial talent 
probably in business history. You look at the trillions of dollars of corporate wealth created by the companies that spun off a Fairchild, and you get an idea of just how much talent was inside that place. Noyce decided it was time he too began afresh. In 1968, he and Gordon Moore left Fairchild to start up a new firm. It would become the largest semiconductor company in the world, and the first to be a household name. Its two founders christened it Intel. Such was the reputation of Noyce and Moore that the company raised two and a half million dollars overnight. They planned to focus on an application of the integrated circuit that they thought had massive growth potential, computer memory. With memory, you could see a function that could be made in larger blocks and sold generally. So it was an opportunity to make a complex circuit uh, and in high volume so you could amortize the design cost. That was really the opportunity I saw. Intel's first big memory chip deal was with the computer giant Honeywell. But the two companies had a difference of opinion over the chip's design. Still struggling to establish itself, Intel desperately needed to win over its client. Our survival was pinned to that one device. If we didn't make that, we were be done to making niche devices, small volume devices. We could never be a real company. I was giving this pitch to uh, probably something like 35 engineers from Honeywell, and most of them were sitting with very glum-looking faces with their arms crossed. When I was through, uh, Bob Noyce stepped up to the podium, and uh, Bob Noyce had a, a voice that was very low, and when he spoke, everyone listened. And when he was done, they seemed to be convinced. So uh, it was a, not my technical pitch that uh, accomplished the mission. It was Bob Noyce's own personal charisma that affected the switch. But as well as his personal charm, Noyce could draw on the industry-wide reputation that he had earned at Fairchild. By the time he founded Intel, he held a unique position of authority in the Valley. He was regarded as such an important person that his blessing, his approval, not his money, not his involvement, but just that alone was important to an incredible number of people. What I saw was an unending sequence of visitors paying homage to Dr. Noyce. And I said to myself, it looks like nobody in this valley is willing to try a new job or a new product or a new anything without going to the Pope and getting his blessings. Noyce's recognition factor and extensive contacts meant his natural role at Intel was to be the public face of the company. His lab and management days were behind him. But he and Moore still thought very hard about the company's culture. As at Fairchild, they were determined Intel would not be stifled by the dead hand of authority. Rather, it would be built around innovation and collaboration. You can do some things in a startup that probably don't work forever in a company, but they also can uh, start some of the culture items that uh, may be valuable long term. I think we did that at Intel. When you went into the building, you couldn't find Bob Noyce's office because Bob Noyce didn't have an office. Bob Noyce had a cubicle like everybody else. This was very much Silicon Valley, but Intel took it to the nth degree. The idea that you might be worth a billion dollars, you may have been hired last week, but you're all the same. You're all an engineer. Hi. Good morning. How, How are, you, are you? Oh, pretty well. How are you doing? Good, good. Noyce wanted Intel to be run more like a very large lab team than a hierarchy. He actively encouraged staff to pursue their own ideas. And in one particular case, this would trigger the most important invention in the industry since the integrated circuit. This was the microprocessor, a programmable integrated circuit that would become the brain of all modern computers. 
The idea for the microprocessor came from Ted Hoff, an Intel engineer. Intel was developing a set of chips for a Japanese calculator firm, but Hoff decided that the existing plans were far too complicated. If you look at a calculator and you think about the various parts of it, it would take electronic systems to run the printer, electronic systems to scan the keyboard. All of this was to be done with special integrated circuits that added to the complexity of the calculator. Hoff proposed building a single master integrated circuit that could be programmed to perform several different functions, not just calculations. In other words, a computer on a chip. But the Japanese engineers weren't convinced that this was feasible. So Hoff went to Noyce instead. I told him about the concerns about the uh, engineers and so on. He said, continue to pursue it. So he was very encouraging to take a bolder step and not be quite so willing to let the customer decide every aspect of, of the design. Intel persuaded the Japanese firm to back Hoff's proposal. A young Italian chip designer, Federico Fagin, turned the idea into a working model. Reluctant just to hand over all the rights to the device, Intel renegotiated the Japanese deal. In 1971, they launched the chip, the 4004, as the first commercially available microprocessor. Well, this is the uh, Intel 4004, the, the world's first microprocessor. Uh, it is packaged in a 16-pin package, uh, and basically it replaces uh, uh, about uh, uh, several thousand discrete components that were used before, or tens of integrated circuits, uh, and it performed the function which uh, for the day was quite, quite fast. Here's a, here's a display of the first microprocessor, what the chip looked like. Of course, it was a lot smaller than that. And this is the calculator that it was to be used in, one of several different designs. And it shows a circuit board, and you can see the microprocessor is the package that has sort of the gold lid on it. This was our first ad, which was 1971, announcing a new era of integrated electronics. And uh, this was actually, I believe, a full, like, double-page ad. Although the sales grew slowly because it takes time to design it in and so on and to create uh, new products and have enough volume to, to feed the factory, uh, the, the movement was, uh, was irreversible and, uh, uh, and, and industry, a real industry was created. Noyce now hit the road. Like a traveling preacher, he evangelized on behalf of the new device. He wasn't trying to create a personal computer industry, which was still several years away. Instead, Noyce promoted the microprocessor as a far more general purpose technology. My dad used to draw the analogy of the, uh, the fractional horsepower motor, where Originally, electric motors were things you had in a factory that ran all the belts that ran the, the sanding machines and the cutting machines. But eventually, when smaller motors were made, they could be put into vacuum cleaners and washing machines and coffee grinders and all kinds of things that really were not envisioned back when the electric motor was invented. Noyce's vision was that the microprocessor could be used to put simple intelligence into everyday devices, from elevators to petrol pumps, what became known as embedded control. And as far as I know, the embedded control applications probably represent something like a order of magnitude. More processors go into that area than go into desktop and notebook computers. Just about two weeks ago, I went in to get my third pacemaker, in other words, so still healing up from the incision, but that has a microprocessor in it, and when I go see the doctor, he puts a device on it, and it reads out, tells out all sorts of information about what my heart's been doing, and, uh, you know, that way he can see if there's any warning signs and any additional steps have to be done. 
Noyce might not have directly invented the memory chip or the microprocessor, but he was certainly their godfather. To all outward appearances, Noyce looked to be riding high, but those closest to him knew that the picture was deceptive. In one crucial area, his marriage to Betty, Noyce had been struggling for years. Unhappy in California, Betty was spending increasing time in her native New England. Noyce, meanwhile, was not always faithful. My father thought that the divorce, when it came, was really a failure, and that he felt very, uh, he felt very bad for a couple of years. He was the only person in his family to ever go through a divorce. Noyce's unhappiness was compounded by the layoff of a third of Intel's employees in 1974, the result of a downturn in the global economy following the oil crisis the previous year. I can recall walking into Bob's office um, and um, he was uh, looking down at his desk and he was quite unhappy. He said, uh, I don't see why we have to negatively affect people's lives for a few cents to give to Wall Street, if you will. The company, even before the layoffs, was too big for Bob's comfort zone. There were too many issues of growth, organization, infighting, the same kind of thing that made him miserable as Fairchild. Noyce decided to re-examine his role at Intel and step back from some of his day-to-day -day responsibilities. Noyce lost his direction for a while in the mid-1970s. So much of what had defined him to himself was in flux. But this period of directionlessness would not last long. Noyce was about to take on some remarkable new roles that would define the remainder of his life and the future of Silicon Valley. On Thanksgiving Day 1975, Noyce remarried to Intel's personnel director, Ann Bowers. Bob and I talked about what he was going to do next a lot. He felt that his chief contribution was not technical anymore, but was giving back uh, in terms of helping promising entrepreneurs that he, he thought had really good ideas to, to go forward. Noyce's most significant relationship by far with a young entrepreneur began in 1977 when he was introduced to a 22-year-old named Steve Jobs, co-founder of a small computer manufacturing company called Apple. Steve was a very compelling young person. He had a big vision. He was very determined. As a person, he intrigued Bob less than his actual technology at that point. He just sort of started showing up at our house on his motorcycle usually, and so then there would be these extended conversations because I'd feed him and they'd talk, and we took him on some vacations with us. He was fun to have around, if, if sometimes a little difficult, because he would, um, he had expectations that people would help him in ways they couldn't always fulfill. We had a, a dinner here back in the 70s with uh, Governor Jerry Brown, and quite a few members of the industry were here, and Steve was here with Bob. Uh, you know, Bob Noyce just took the lead, almost automatically, because he would ask penetrating questions. He would um, begin addressing the issues very pointedly. Steve sat there admiringly. I think he saw everybody else as sort of people making things, where he said Bob as a thinker. There's a type of family tree in Silicon Valley, and in the same way that Steve Jobs came to Noyce for advice and mentorship when Apple was young, the founders of Google came to Jobs for advice and mentorship when their company was young. So Noyce can be seen as the grandfather to many of these young companies here in the valley.
It wasn't just in Silicon Valley that Noyce was seen as the eldest statesman of the industry. His achievements were now being recognized at the highest levels. Noyce tried to use this influence to draw attention to what he increasingly saw as a mortal threat to the American semiconductor industry. Competition from Japan. The Americans didn't realize it yet, but they were swimming against the tide. Most American companies, Intel included, did not put a lot of capacity, manufacturing capacity, in place in the late 70s. The Japanese did. By the time the early and mid-80s came around, they had factories, they had money, they had people trained. We didn't. By the 1980s, Japan was beating America on price and reliability. Intel, which had been founded to produce memory chips, was forced to pull out of them and concentrate on microprocessors. We were having meetings in our living room about what would happen if, if Intel had to be shut down. It was that severe. The business was in big trouble. After years of trying to rally the industry, Noyce helped convince America's rival semiconductor firms to found a consortium called Semitech, based in Austin, Texas, to develop and share new technology. It was believed that if they pooled their money, I think it was $270 million, built this facility, they could do experimentation with new kinds of wafer processing, packaging, all of those kinds of things. Well, they got it going, and Noyce had been a major player in all of that. And then there was a feeling that, that Semitech was going to fail unless somebody came in and gave it a high profile. And so everybody naturally looked to Noyce. Noyce faced a dilemma. He was enjoying his semi-retirement and knew that mediating between all the rival companies that had a hand in Semitech would be a draining and thankless task. But there was no other clear contender for the role. Bob was, was struggling with his congregational conscience, which was if you start something, you have to see it through. If the issue hadn't been whether this whole industry that he basically had started was going to make it or not, I think maybe he could have said no. But once again, you get to his feelings that he was responsible for all these people that he'd brought into the business, and not just at Intel, but at other places, and that he really, he could not just walk away from that. In the summer of 1988, Noyce left his beloved California for Texas to become a head of Semitech. At the age of 60, he was taking on one of the most demanding roles in the industry. Time is of the essence for this because the overseas competition is not sitting still and we have to get going fast. Noyce embarked on a punishing schedule in which his time was split between running Semitech in Texas, meeting politicians and business leaders in Washington, and raising public awareness of the industry wherever and whenever he could. My father worked really hard at Semitech, and I think one of the hardest things was that he was constantly on the road. He was very, very busy. I hardly saw him. He felt a great deal of pressure to make this thing work. The last real conversation I had with Bob Noyce was we were filming a television show for American Public Television. And he happened to be in town, and uh, we got some time with him, and he came into the studio. And when he came in for the shoot, he was still Bob Noyce. I think he looked a little older, he looked tired, but most of all, he missed the valley. Yes, but when people think of Silicon Valley, a lot of them see Bob Noyce's face on it. <laughs> and, and Bob Noyce has gone back to the prairie. I went down to Texas with the idea of doing a job that I thought was very, very important. I will stay there until I can find somebody that can do it better than I, I can. When I find somebody that can do it better than I can, I will leave. Where I'll go, I don't know. I might go to Aspen. <laughs> <laughs> but by April 1990, and after nearly two years in the job, Noyce had decided to step down regardless. He was satisfied that he'd convinced Washington of the importance of Semitech and secured the cooperation of the companies which made up the consortium. He told Anne he would retire by the end of the year. 
We had a lovely piece of property on the coast that we thought we would spend a lot of time um, at. We both rode and really liked being outside. We had all sorts of places we wanted to go and see and do, and we had an increasingly large family. We're starting to have grandchildren, and and he just wanted to stop. <laughs> On June the 1st, 1990, Noyce arrived at Semitec to find that the staff had thrown him a surprise party, declaring it Bob Noyce Day and wearing specially printed t-shirts. Two days later, Noyce took his regular morning swim at his house in Austin. As he rested afterwards, he suffered a heart attack and could not be revived. He was 62. He had always been a swimmer. In a way, he swam through the modern world. He was always very graceful, very smooth, never seemed to expend any extra amounts of energy. He had begun that way all the way back at Grinnell, and to have him go out that way was, there was something powerfully symbolic about that. Noyce died on the cusp of the 1990s the decade that would see the technology he developed and fostered become the motor of the digital world. Intel, the company he co-founded, is now the world's largest chip manufacturer, responsible for the microprocessors in more than 80% of personal computers. Many of Noyce's colleagues have enjoyed public recognition for their achievements. But even in Silicon Valley, beyond a few memorials, it's unclear how many people today are aware of the enormous debt they owe Bob Noyce. Silicon Valley seems to have forgotten Bob Noyce. But then again, Silicon Valley forgets almost everything because amnesia is one of the traits of entrepreneurship. If you're constantly looking back, then you find a million reasons not to take the next risk. So we intentionally forget about what came before us. As a result, we oftentimes make the same mistake over and over again. I would hope that people would see Bob as, um, as a person who was, who was really a whole person. He was not one-dimensional. It was not all about making money. I think he led a very admirable life, and I hope that people can look at that and be inspired. Even if these young technologists don't know Noyce's name. His spirit lives on in Silicon Valley. Every time somebody chooses knowledge over hierarchy or an exciting new idea over a safe one, they are taking part in that spirit uh, that Bob Noyce helped to create here in the Valley. And Noyce liked to say, don't be encumbered by history. Go off and do something wonderful. Next tonight here on BBC4, we revisit Bulgaria's abandoned children.